UFH. Not UHF like on TV. UFH stands for Union, Fork, and Ho. For a couple of years in World War II, 42 and 43, they made bayonets, 10-inch bayonets, for the M1 Grand. We're revisiting this today. We've done a little bit of cleanup on the stock. We've uh, done some work to make this front hand guard match the rest as best we could, the rest of this uh, finish. And um, I've spent a lot of time looking at parts and learning what we can about parts identification and things of that nature. A lot of immersion. I've had a lot of hard time sleeping lately. And uh, my attention's been going, you guessed it, to learning everything I can about the, uh, the M1 uh, Grand. So today we're going to talk about this rifle in terms of parts, breaking it down. Going to give you a, a real brief tutorial on how this old leather sling is supposed to go on and why it goes on that way. We're going to talk briefly about ammo. Also, we're going to talk about what's out there in terms of shooting type stuff so nice overview today um warning this is going to be a lot of uh a lot of gun nerdery boring stuff we're not shooting this guy today i'll reference you to my prior video and uh, probably some future videos shooting this bad boy but we're going to talk about this 1955 springfield armory and uh, this is the m1 grand this is DR Drake 63. Stay tuned. Okay, so uh, we picked this up about a week ago. And uh, as uh, you saw in pictures in the introduction, originally this handguard uh, was a different color stain than the rest of uh, the rest of the rifle. The biggest reason was it was obviously a replacement handguard. I also believe it's a different kind of wood. I don't believe this is... Uh, walnut like the stock is it might even be birch not a hundred percent sure but i had to do a lot of uh experimenting and back and forth to get this color right i did not want to uh, have to completely take down uh the the finish on this stock and, and restain it just to have this match so i was focusing on two things one is is we did clean up a lot of the grime a lot of the a lot of the uh um where you had the old uh either boiled linseed oil, raw linseed oil, whatever they were using, uh, had just got dirty looking over the years and uh, got a lot of that off with some acetone. And as far as this, I tried some different reds, I tried some different dark walnuts, nothing would match this. Uh, and then I said, what the heck, I'm gonna try some dye that I use for leather working projects and I'll be darned if it didn't come out just to be about perfect. So after letting that dry, um, then we started putting boiled linseed oil on this uh, on this stock, and uh, I think it turned out pretty good. I mean, I, I know it's a little bit different. I always will. But I want to talk about a few things that, uh, that I've learned through my research that were kind of like, uh, didn't necessarily add up based on how we look at firearms in today's world uh, on this rifle. The first is I want, to pay, I want you to pay attention to this handguard here. And you notice how it slides back and forth a little bit. It's loose. Well, we're kind of uh, conditioned to believe that uh, when, when we have a, a part on a gun, something like that, that it means it's not right. And that was my first thought. Did quite a bit of look, and it turns out that that's actually on purpose. You ought to be able to fit a couple business cards in this gap when you've got to push forward, and that's exactly how it fits. The reason it's loose is because... Uh, the gas tube is underneath here, and the way that this fits into the rest of uh, the rest of the uh, of the stock and so forth, if you don't have a gap there, when this heats up, it's going to affect your accuracy accuracy possibly greatly. So this was on purpose, which I would have never known that interesting fact about the the Grand. Um, along those same lines, we're going to look at this bayonet right here. Uh, we started out as told you it's from Union Fork and Ho. And it's got this flying bomb logo underneath and there's no date there's nothing union fork and and hole was not dated they made this for two years and that's about it okay anyway um so the first time i put this bayonet on clicked into place real nice but this thing's kind of loose and i'm thinking man 
do I got a bad bayonet? Is the lug an issue or what? Actually, this is pretty commonplace. And uh, they were loose tolerances for a number of reasons. One is this barrel starts heating up. You don't want something on it that's so tight that you're going to affect your accuracy. You know, the Marines did a test with these rifles back in the 40s, and they found that even if you just put a penny on the end of the barrel, uh, it can affect the accuracy by half a foot at a couple hundred yards, especially when it heats up. So uh, these guys were no dummies. They knew what they were doing. Secondly, this has to be able to go on whether there's grit, whether there's grime or anything. It's not important that this thing is a, a stealth kind of scenario. Uh, if you're fixing bayonets in a war kind of situation, uh, the enemy knows where you are, and you're not sneaking up on it. It's a close quarters combat kind of scenario. And, uh, uh, but I found that kind of interesting. Now, there are some things you can do. Uh, if you look real close, you'll see a channel here, and that's where this snaps in and it's spring-loaded. And here you have a button which, which releases it. Um, you can, if you're really uptight about it fitting tight, there are some things you can do. You could put a little piece of paper in there or something just to take away some of this wiggle room and, uh, and then get it right. But uh, it's not bad or defective because it does that. It's just the way it is. So there you have it. Now, these are a little bit more expensive bayonets to get um, of this design because you had a lot of the older ones that were longer. They were like 16 inches, I believe. And the way you can tell is on the, the older ones, this channel, which is called the blood channel, go figure, it runs all the way to the end because it was on a, a 16 inch instead of a 10 inch blade. So you can tell they just cut them down and, and this channel would run the whole length. This was a purpose built 10 inch, 10 inch blade. Again, the company is Union Fork and Ho. They only did it for a couple of years and uh, this is considered a more valuable bayonet to get than say, uh, there's ones out there called Greek Contract, which basically, you know, uh, they were made by the Greeks or something like that, obviously makes sense. But this is a situation that I would not want to run into this by any, any means, I would not. Uh, but uh, I find that to be very interesting. So as far as uh, this, this rifle itself, I was corrected by somebody when I did my intro video to this, when you pull back this operating rod, which today's world we'd call the charging handle, tendency is to do this kind of grip, and they, they were taught, no, don't do that. You want to grab it underneath and open it just like that, okay? The thought being that if you have the overhand grip, you could somehow get your thumb caught in there. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Show you a couple other things. This right here is your safety. Okay, so that's engaged. The thought right there is you just go in with your finger and now you're ready to pull the trigger. Obviously, I just showed you this was not chambered. But you can see right here, uh, whereas before it was kind of a solid, kind of uh, reddish hue, a little bit more like you see on the worn spots where your hands go. Uh, this does have a, a, a very attractive grain that we're able to get this down to without having to restain. And as you can see up front, it's just not the same kind of wood. So this is probably as close as we're going to get. Um, and I'm happy with the result. Now, I've gone ahead and I've taken off the sling. And we're going to show you how to put that on later. And again, I do want to warn you now, we are getting to the... Uh, uh, a little bit more technical, a little bit more boring part of, uh, of the program for some of you. I'll see comments on my videos where people will say, well, it took till 522 to get to the point or something like that. <clears throat> I'm definitely not meant for the guy with a short attention span. If you're a gun nerd like me and you want to hear as much detail as you possibly can, keep watching. If, uh, if you're somebody that needs lots of rock and roll music and quick cuts between takes and stuff like that, probably a good time to turn off anyway so here i've got my m1 grand <clears throat> i want to make sure once again that we are empty which there's not a, a bullet in the chamber anything like that okay now i can go ahead and put it on safe anyway just to make some of you guys happy we're going to take this thing apart i want to show you how easy it is okay so they had to make this something that you can field strip 
okay? So all I'm gonna do right here is on this trigger, I'm gonna pull back and lift up and look at that. The trigger group has come out. I wanna show you one of the things as I pull these parts off, I'm gonna show you what, what I'm looking at when I talk about the stamps, okay? so. Unlike a lot of, uh, say, European-type firearms where you have matching numbers throughout, uh, these were mass-produced rifles. So, you know, they used a lot of the principles um, of assembly line and interchangeable parts. So you're not going to have your trigger guard match uh, the serial number that's on your receiver, and you're not going to have that match with, you know, all that kind of stuff. But what, what I've done is gone back and looked and seen that this particular stamping for the trigger guard... Um, number one, you see the SA on there. It is uh, from Springfield Armory. And it's the stamping matches up according to data of the, the proper year that's associated with the 1955 rifle. So I'm going to set that aside. Now I want you to notice how easy it is just to pull this stock up. And there you go. Whole stock has come off. I mean... That's an easier takedown than just about any firearm I've ever experienced. I'm sure somebody's going to say, hey, but what about this or that? So now we're down to our basic com components. You have the action. You have your operating rod. We're going to show you how that comes out. Um, and then, you know, I call this the charging handle. It's just called the operating rod handle. Here's your bolt. I'm going to show you how easy this is, okay? The first thing we're going to do is right here... This spring attaches right here to this piece right here, which is basically your elevator, okay? I call it your elevator. It's, it's you, you put your ammo in the magazine and this, this is what lifts it up and down. So I'm gonna pull that out and that spring comes right out. So there you go. Not using any tools or anything like that. Okay, so now that I've taken that spring out, this piece, which is basically your internal magazine, is what your, your clip rides on. This can be taken out, but what I need to do is first is all these parts that you see right here, all right on this pin right here. And so it was set up that you could actually just take the point of a bullet and get it started. I can pull this pin right out here and a lot of the stuff hinges on that pin. So this is the only quote-unquote tool I've used. It's around a 30-odd six. Now, as you can see, these parts are all loose. This part comes out. This part, which is, again, your ammo rests on top of that, and the spring actuates it up inside your magazine. Okay. This piece comes out, and then this piece, which is actually just pulls out just like that, okay? And that's really what we're talking about so far. Now what I have is, is my bolt, which, as you can see, travels along this line, and it cams right off of um, uh, a little channel in here that I'll show you in a minute. I thought that'd be good to show you just basically how this works, okay? So you see your bolt right there right now. The, lo the lugs are locked into place right up front, okay? And it cams right in here inside the operating channel. So you'll see when I pull it back, the first thing you do is you see it rotate, see? It's not a lot, but it's enough to lock it into place. So it rotates and travels back all the way to the back and as you can even see there's a little cut out here for the firing pin so it's not going to come into contact with anything so i'm just thinking that's a pretty slick way of doing business very simple and locks into the chamber ready to go and then your hammer is going to follow hit the back of that firing pin seems simple by today's standard, but very innovative when uh, John Guerin developed this.
Also, in terms of getting this out, you move it, and then it wants to come out just like right there. There's just a little channel where that comes out. And there you go. You can see this is relatively clean. When I got this, it was relatively clean. But I've recently just cleaned it. But here you're going to see another set of serial numbers stamped right on here. And again, I've checked these out, and these correspond to, to a, a rod that's going to be a period correct for a 55, and it is Springfield Armory. And I told you I'd show you where that cam channel is, and that's where the one of the lugs of the bolt travels when it rotates. Or part of the bolt. Okay. So, once we've done all that, the only thing left to do is take out the bolt. And that is pretty simple. There's not a lot holding it in place now. So here she is. And... Yet another set of uh, uh, stamps. This little ding right here is actually a proof mark. And then you see uh, a number of things that point out, including this uh, A15. And these numbers uh, indicate that this also would have been, uh, 1955 would have been an appropriate manufacturer year. So when they re-arsenal these things, I don't think they go to the trouble to do all that. Um, chances are this is original, but maybe not. But the barrel being stamped correctly kind of leads me to believe that. And we're going to look at that next. So, underneath this proof mark you see SA and then F6535448. That corresponds with, and that's kind of hard to read right there, um, is it a 3? Is it an 8? I believe that's March of 1955. The A220A is another marking, which uh, I believe talks about uh, uh, batch number, metallurgy. And then here you see right here, to the far right, you see that eagle with the three stars over it. That's the, the Defense Department's acceptance. And then you see a couple more proof stamps. Now, why are there two of them? Well, a lot of times they'll have one proof stamp when they complete the barrel and another one when they test fire it. Over here, the P just means that it's been proofed. The S is very likely um, an initial of the guy that, uh, that inspected it. Or it could maybe be the other way around. But this was not a bring back. This did not go to the Philippines or India or anywhere else. And... As you can see, the barrel's just in really good shape. And you can see going up along this handguard, and uh, there's that bayonet lug we talked about. And then at the very end here, you're going to see this piece right here, which unscrews, and that's, that's a plug. This is your gas tube. I'm not going to get into that for purposes of today. I wanted to show you a quick down and dirty field disassembly. And so as far as cleaning, you know, you're going to want to, anywhere where metal's traveling, you're going to want to do some cleaning. Here on the receiver again, some more markings or stampings. And again, I've verified this is correct. This is period correct. And uh, we already saw the receiver. So this was, this was the one, I mean, 6 million was the last. This is 583-3741. So it's kind of getting up there towards the end of production so there's there's no historical connection with this the design is historical but as I as I mentioned in, in prior uh, video uh, I picked out the best barrel in the bunch not the one that had the most history and uh, I think I did well with that regard but you can kind of see here's your parts not too complicated not too complicated at all and the only thing I needed tool-wise to take this down was something you'd probably have with you in the field anyway. So believe me, they were thinking about that when they did loose tolerances on hand guards, loose tolerances on bayonets, um, and, and the whole takedown process. This is, this is pretty easy. 
Now the question might be asked, how do you put this together? And I would say, without trying to be too much of a smart ass, you put it together the opposite of how you take it down. <laughs> the things to look for are, are definitely, remember you've got three things that are running around this takedown pin right here. And you need to make sure that they're lined up. And the one thing that might take you a little bit of time, and I don't know how well you can see this. You see this thing wiggling right here? Okay. That is your, um, your clip release mechanism. I'm depressing a button on the side. And basically, after you, you get one out of the chamber, if you press this, it'll eject your clip if you want to unload your rifle. But anyway... Um, this piece right here that, that forks around, you'll notice it runs down inside. You need to have this end of this guy needs to be underneath this part that I showed you in order to uh, get everything lined up. If it's not, you'll sit there all day wondering why your hole doesn't line up. So there's some genius to that. Parts won't fit together uh, and let you put this thing back together if they're not correct. So it's really not complicated, guys. You do it a couple times. It's very intuitive. Very intuitive. Okay, so to put the stock back on. We're simply putting that back into place. You see this trigger group, which I think is just so cool how this is self-contained. Put this down with the trigger up until you're flat here, and then there you go. I've got a solid rifle. Let's see. Yep, everything works. Locks up nice and tight like we need it to. That's all there is to it. Now if you recall, earlier I was talking, I was trying to show you during reassembly, that one piece that needed to be on the right side of the magazine release, and there it is. That's what it looks like when it's assembled. We were looking at it upside down. So that's the piece right there. And how you activate that is through this button right here. It's a little spring-loaded affair. And in order to do that, you are holding back on the bolt. You've got this guy kind of pushed down. It's not a super easy operation, but it's something that you can do. Let's see if we can show you. Okay, so I want to make sure my safety's on for this. I've got my my uh, charging handle pulled back. And I've got, right here, is what's called an M-block. There's eight rounds in here. As you drop this down in here, like so. And it's not going to slam shut as long as you've got pressure on it. But as soon as you do, there you go. Okay, so sometimes you have to help it. Sometimes it's going to go on its own. That's just the way it is. That's not a design flaw. But let's say, for example, that what we wanted to do was eject the magazine right now without firing. In other words, we want to unload this rifle. Okay, well, like I said, we've got it on safe. So the first thing we're going to do, and you saw the round come flying out there, then we're going to Rather than let the next round load, we're going to put our hand here to catch it, and I'm going to depress this button, and out comes the magazine. And that's all she wrote. So that's how that works. Okay, pretty easy, huh? As you can see, there's there's nothing in there. We'll talk about ammo just a little bit, and then we're going to talk about uh, using these uh, these leather slings, which actually go back to the 1903 Springfield. And, uh, and wrap this up, but uh, one of the things when, when, when I was demonstrating how to load this and, and how to eject this, um, I went against what I told you about the proper grip to put on this, uh, uh, this handle right here when, when you're doing all that stuff. Well, a lot of it just had to do with the fact that I'm making a video and I had to get in some weird positions to do it. I don't have anybody helping me make these videos, so... Uh, you know, my apologies to the purists out there, but I was hoping to give you guys the basic idea. Anyway, you can kind of, again, see here how uh, we've got some different grain patterns between this wood 
in this wood right here. And uh, uh, as we talked about earlier, the match is going to be kind of tough, perfect. But I think I got it pretty close. I've seen some really bad examples out there, including the way this one was when I got it. But getting back to ammo here, um, these end blocks are real interesting designs. I think they're cool. A lot of people like to talk about, well, you know, you don't fire the last round because you don't want to give away your position. And uh, I guess the one thing I'd have to say, guys, is if uh, you're firing 30 odd six at your enemy, he probably knows where you are generally. But I think that's a bit of a wives' tale. But anyway, kind of interesting here uh, on this particular ammo. I don't know where it came from, but it's ball ammo. It's 150 grain. It's kind of interesting. They even show you on the top of the can. They paint this little pattern just so everybody knows that this is uh, this is for an M1 uh, grand. And this comes 280 uh, cartridges. And you see over here, I just picked this up. This is new production. And uh, this comes basically a nice big ammo box, 500 rounds. And it comes in these boxes of 20. So got quite a few that uh, quite a few that we can fire here between uh, between these two boxes I I think I've got somewhere around 680 rounds or so to fire and we're looking uh, price wise these guys are running oh you're gonna you're gonna be spending somewhere around 60 cents a piece typically now there's gonna be guys that can tell you where you can get them cheaper I get it I've given some thought to taking this deer hunting. In order to do so, I would not fire 150 grain FMJ. I would need to find something. I think I'd stay away from a soft point like a, a Remington Corlocked or something with this kind of action. But uh, Federal Fusion makes some nice, uh, some nice ammunition that I've used. And so if I could find 150 grain there, I think we'd be good to go. But we're going to test that out at some point. But just overall... Um, you know, as you can see, general condition, somewhere along the line, somebody banged something into this. You know, in the Army, they don't really handle stuff too gingerly like uh, we do our own equipment. Um, that's just a different mentality when when this is a tool than when it's some prized possession that you're going to sit on your back porch and make videos about. Let's talk about this sling. When you get it out of a package, it's going to look like this. You're going to look at it and you're going to say, I don't really know what I'm doing with this. So I'm going to show you to the best of my ability how, how to thread it. It's not hard once you've done it once and it all makes sense. So let's take a look. First of all, I look like I'm really pissed off right here. It's because my dog would not quit barking. But anyway, I'm showing you uh, the rear and the, uh, the front sling attachments. And we're going to take this one piece, which is the hook. Well, with the buckle on it. And we're going to run that through the rear sling attachment, just as you see right there. We're going to leave that alone for a second. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take the front hook, just like you see right there. We're going to run that through that buckle, and we're going to take the other end and run it through the front sling attachment. So here you go, just like that. Now what's important here is we want to go ahead and run that loop over both of those uh, doubled up pieces of leather that you see right there. And then that comes over the top. Now, from the rear now, we're taking uh, the back hook and we're attaching it, as you can see, as far forward as we can uh, on the front piece. And now the front two hooks are going to attach as far up as we can, pulling them tight. And there you go should make more sense right now and you have uh, you have something that uh, you can use as a, a base for firing well now I'm going to show you how you open this up for carrying and so forth so first you take the rear sling hooks move them back as far as you can then you're going to um, slide your loops forward and you're going to adjust this front sling hook again giving yourself some more slack and now it fits uh, rather easily over your, your shoulders. I'm a pretty big guy shoulder-wise with a coat on or whatever. There's plenty of room here for me. And then you're able to uh, unshoulder this fairly easily and be in a position to shoot. So that's all there is to it. Okay. So all the stuff I've just showed you about the M1 Grand 
for the most part are things I didn't know a week ago. So I've been pretty knee deep immersed into uh, learning about the various parts of this, how it breaks down, uh, what the history of this particular rifle might be. As I indicated before, there's, there's not a, any war history with this or anything like that. But what it is is a darn good shooter that uh, is, is in uh, pretty decent shape. So I'm not gonna upgrade this stock. I'm not looking to, uh, to put a, a perfect looking stock on this. Part of this rifle's accuracy is gonna, is gonna be about the, the fit with the receiver and the barrel and the stock that I have. So part of that's if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And the other part is if I'm looking for a brand new rifle, then I probably shouldn't be getting an M1 Grand anyway. But uh, totally enjoy this thing. I've been wanting one of these for a long time, as, as I mentioned before. I think this is a, a great shooting bunch of fun. I hope you've enjoyed uh, just learning some little tidbits with me. There's going to be some guys watching that know a lot more about this firearm than I do. And of course, as always, we welcome your comments. This is DR Drake 63 saying thanks for watching.